Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to another amazing event here at the Noman stage. And hello to all of you out there on Twitch and YouTube. Yeah, no, I'm actually I'm pointing at this camera right here. I'm tricking out some of the students here. I'm pointing to you. Yes, you at home on Twitch, YouTube, or Facebook. Speaking of Facebook, if you need closed captionings, head on over to our Facebook, and that's where you can get that. Now, <clears throat> I also want to take a second to thank you to send a thank you to our sponsor, Lenovo. Without them, we wouldn't be able to have fantastic events such as tonight. Speaking of fantastic events, our guest this evening is currently a freelance character designer and creative director who, for 15 years, has worked for companies such as Activision, Sony, DreamWorks, Feature Animation, Sideshow Collectibles, Fox, and also designed characters for Guitar Hero, Tony Hawk, and was also a teacher right here at Noman. And is so kindly taking time off from his multi-platform original IP Sleepwalker to join us here live on stage tonight at Noman. Please welcome Cameron Scott Davis. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for thank you for braving the cold and coming out tonight. You guys are already heroes in my book. Um, yeah, if, as uh, as mentioned, uh, we will be discussing the the hero's journey and how that applies to character design. Um, and yes, thank you, Chris, and thank you for Noman uh, for having me. Um, I thought that I would start the hero's journey uh, with. The idea of the circle. And the hero's journey uh, uh, originated by a man named uh, Joseph Campbell. Um, much like life itself is a circle. Um, Carl Jung, uh, a contemporary of, of Campbell's, um, Jung says, the most powerful religious symbol is the circle. The circle is one of the great primordial images of mankind, and that in considering the symbol of the circle, we are analyzing the self. Uh, you've all heard of the circle of life, Elton John. Um, and the circle is found in so many aspects of, of our life. Uh, as human beings, it's it's part of the the human psyche, the circle. Um, uh, so again, this lecture will be about the hero's journey, and so for some of you may be familiar with this, or some of you may be the first time hearing it. But um, in 1949, um, a historian, an anthropologist, writer um, Joseph Campbell uh, published a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces um, in 1949. And what he discovered uh, in his research of, of many cultures across time and, and space, what, where there was, things started to, uh, motifs started to repeat across all of these cultures and all of these, uh, these uh, religions and, and ideas uh, the world over across time. Uh, so he started to notice all these patterns and that there was essentially one story of the hero. It was disguised or, or had a different aesthetic depending on where it was in the world or what time that it was told, but essentially it had the same, there was these, these patterns that were repeated over and over. Uh, so he wrote this book of the hero with a thousand faces. Um, if you look at um, the hero in the in the mythology of 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 the Buddha, there's a there's there's a, a, a leaving of the natural world. There is a, a tests or trials or initiation. He called it initiation or for, in fulfillment, and then typically some kind of a sacrifice, self sacrifice. And then a return to a return to 
the, the natural world with a different view than you had when you left. And that's all of you here. If you're going to school at Noman, you're all on, you're all on your journey. You've already accepted the call to action or the, the call to adventure. You're here, you, you've, you've left the, you crossed the first threshold, if you will, um, and, you're, and you're beginning your, your journey and your, and your education at this, at this wonderful school. Uh, I don't expect you to read all that or remember all that, but this is basically what we'll be going, um, what we be going over uh, in this first part of the lecture. Um, so what is a hero? A hero, um, a hero is someone who, who's, who gives their life for something bigger than themselves. Um, you know, whether that's uh, like a Jesus character uh, sacrificing metaphorically themselves for the sins of all mankind, or or maybe you just as an artist or as a sculptor or as, as a designer want to, you know, put your whole self into this career and and become something greater than yourself to give back uh, and tell stories to the world, whatever your goal is. Oh, I got to stop doing that. <laughs> um, so what makes up... Uh, Kind of the the aspects of a of a of a hero. Um, number one is that they are empathetic. They do things um, that make them likable, that make them relatable. Um, there's a great, um, I guess I would kind of describe it as the cliff notes to story structure for screenwriting, called Save the Cat. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but. Uh, uh, author named Blake Snyder come up with the, came up with this idea um, that kind of lays out the the classic Hollywood structure for a ninety minute uh, feature film uh, when when screenwriting that certain things happen at certain you, they call it a Hollywood formula perhaps um, you know you you start to if you know if you're about two thirds of the way through the film. That the uh, the dark night of the soul is coming, and the, about three quarters of the way, the the hero is going to hit rock bottom. Uh, so, in Save the Cat, he describes the hero needs to do something within the first ten pages of a screenplay that makes them likable. Um, this being metaphoric, metaphorically saving of a cat. So, Our hero character, in order to make them relatable, in order to make them likable, has to do something like saving an animal, saving, doing something that makes the, us like them, uh, doing something heroic. Um, and the pursuit, uh, once, you know, once the audience is, okay, on board with this character, then the the definition of, of a hero is that their pursuit of that of their goal their what they want the most is is something that drives the narrative um and then the lastly they they grow they grow and they change and they arc uh as they go through their adventure um and again we'll talk about that uh a little bit later um the most the most interesting characters have the biggest arc, whether that's, you know, from from a hero to a villain or a villain to a hero. If you think about, uh, for instance, Game of Thrones, if you think about um, Daenerys, she starts out very, uh, very kind. She's the uh, the freer of slaves, and she ends up as uh, the destructor of an entire city. Uh, that would be a very large, interesting arc. Uh, Contrary to that, Jamie Lannister starts out as kind of the most despicable, horrible character you can think of and um, ends up somewhat likable. Uh, their arcs are dramatic and their arcs are make them very interesting characters. Um, contrary to that, or 
on a side note of that, the character of Jon Snow, while he is likable, um, has a very shallow arc, or perhaps no arc at all. Uh, you know exactly what he's going to do before he does it. Uh, he's always going to do the right thing. He's always going to do the moral thing. And therefore, that character, while likable, is perhaps arguably, arguably less interesting. Um, so the idea of the hero's journey, um, as told by Joseph Campbell, uh, was kind of made popular or was definitely uh, brought to light um, probably the reason we know about it today <laughs> or is it's part of uh, mainstream education is, is because of Star Wars, um, the George Lucas epic. Um, George Lucas credits Campbell's hero's journey with, with being the basic structure with which he was, uh, he was able to wrangle Star Wars um, rather than just being this giant sprawling epic, uh, which I can relate to, um, and kind of narrowing it down and saying, what is it about human nature um, that we all gravitate towards or, or all need to see um, in, in a narrative? Uh, so uh, Campbell says the, uh, the first step is establishing the hero character in their natural environment. This is uh, Luke Skywalker from A New Hope, um, episode four, 1977. And we see Luke in his, in his natural environment, the ordinary world. Um, this is the same um, as you would see, uh, you know, Neo at his... Uh, at his computer or at, a, at his office job uh, in the matrix or, or um, you know, Dorothy on the farm before, uh, before the tornado, before Oz. Um, uh, this, is, this is Alice from Alice in Wonderland being read to. This is Harry Potter in the muggle world. Um, and we're seeing that this character desires more. Luke in this scene is, is I think he's, he witnesses some kind of uh, a space battle going on uh, between the Empire and the, and the Rebellion um, and feels a, a, a lust for action. He's, he's, uh, he's living on this, on this desert planet of Tatooine on a, on a moisture farm and uh, he heard his father is a great pilot, but uh, he's kind of stuck in this in this space. Um, so, if you're going to have a great hero, you have to have uh, this. Is kind of you know after after we establish the the main or the hero in their natural environment, this is kind of when typically when the villain is introduced. Um, obviously this here, Darth Vader, um, visually quite the opposite from Luke. Um, visually you have this, this ominous character. He's got this cape. He's got a, a, a mask on. He's, he's a machine. He's got, you know, contrary to the circle, uh, that we all relate to, he's got this this square box right in the middle of his chest, which is a square, is more of a simple, it, it, it doesn't really occur in nature uh, very often, if at all. Um, uh, it's the symbol of structure, it's the symbol of the, the machine. And, you know, you even say, uh, I think maybe in Return of the Jedi, Vader's more more machine than man. Uh, his 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 mask looks like a skull. It's very creepy. The helmet is reminiscent of um, you know an SS uh, Nazi helmet. Um, and he's got all these blinking lights. And of course, he's all black. He is the shadow. Um, another one of Jungian Young Carl Jung's um, 
uh, philosophical ideas uh, that, that this that there's a shadow to each character. There's there's a part of them. Uh, I don't want to say that in, an evil, but a, a necessary evil, or, or a part that you don't want the rest of the world to see. Um, and so, Darth Vader uh, is a perfect, perfect, perfect villain. Uh, if we go back to uh, Luke's design here. Uh, very soft clothing, and uh, it's the opposite of the shadow in value. It's light in color, and he's very much based on um, kind of a, a Japanese uh, robe, um, almost samurai uh, garb. Uh, so the, the villain is introduced. Uh, the second step on the hero's journey uh, is typically the the call to action, call to adventure, the call to action. Uh, the hero gets a message from some outside force. Um, in this case, uh, he buys a couple of droids, uh, R two D two being the little one that has this secret message from a princess saying, I've been captured and I need, <laughs> help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only help, hope. And um, so this is the call to adventure for Luke. He wants to know who this is. Uh, she's she's asking asking for an Obi-Wan Kenobi, and this is the the call to adventure for Luke. Um, other other call to adventure uh, examples might be the, uh, the owls from Harry Potter, Hagrid, uh, Harry Potter's owl comes and brings a message saying, uh, we're inviting you uh, to come to Hogwarts and study as a wizard. Um, Frodo is given a ring by Bilbo. Um, and, you know, Neo um, wakes up from a dream and is told to, uh, to follow the White Rabbit, another Alice in Wonderland down the rabbit hole um, metaphor. Um, and... So this is the inciting incident that, that sets our, our hero uh, off on their journey. Um, step three is the refusal of the call. This is, this is our hero understanding that there's an adventure to go on, but also realizing that they're not ready to go on that, to go on that adventure. Um, you know, this is, um, I think Luke's, Luke says something about, like, I hate the Empire, but it's, it's, I, I'm so far away here. I can't, there's nothing I can do about this. Or there's an external force. Sometimes the hero is perfectly ready to go on that adventure, but there's some external force that holds them back and kind of forces them to reevaluate, re do I really want to go on this adventure? Um, I woke up kind of laughing today because I, when my alarm went off, I hit snooze and I said, I have just refused the call to adventure and uh, did not want to, did not want to wake up with that, with the cold this morning. Um, but the refusal of the call is, is a metaphor for, for the character clinging to it, it, infantile needs for security. Uh, it's the mother and the father figures presenting or, or preventing that character uh, from true growth and transformation as the ego fails to develop and embrace the world outside the nursery. Um, this, is, this is the character just not ready uh, to go on that adventure. Um, you know, this is, I think, I think in Harry Potter there's, there's a scene where Harry kind of whispers to Hagrid, "I think you got the wrong guy. I'm not, I'm not a wizard, but we all know you are a wizard, Harry." Um, the The next step is uh, is the meeting of the mentor. This is the um, this is the Obi Wan ca character uh, in in Star Wars. Luke goes to. Um, the, the message from the princess says Obi-Wan Kenobi, and he thinks about old Ben Kenobi, 
uh, off in the, the dune sea and says, maybe I'll go. Maybe it's, maybe he knows him. Um, so the meeting of the mentor is, is this, the mentor is, is an, again, an archetypal character that's in all these stories. This is a, this is a character who typically is older. They've already gone through their own hero's journey and have returned with uh, the knowledge necessary to pass it down to the younger generation. Um, this is a character who is familiar with both the ordinary world and the extraordinary world outside of uh, the status quo or the, or the, the basic um, starting point of the, of the hero's journey. They're, 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 they're a guide for the hero and they help them and teach them and train them throughout uh, throughout the story. Uh, this you know this is um, this is Morpheus from the Matrix. This is uh, Glinda the Good Witch um, from Wizard of Oz. This is um, Gandalf, Dumbledore, all these older characters that have this knowledge that they can share with with the um, with the with the young hero. Uh, of our story. Um, next, we get to uh, the crossing of the first threshold. Um, like I said, perhaps that's you guys leaving wherever you came from to, to come to school uh, at Noman. I would call that the, the crossing of the first threshold, the point of no return. Uh, something in the story causes the hero to to cross that line. Uh, in the case of Star Wars, uh, Luke returns from meeting Obi-Wan to find that stormtroopers have, uh, they're looking for uh, the message from the princess and those droids and they've killed, uh, they've murdered uh, his aunt and uncle. Um, so Luke really has has nothing left of his home world. There's nothing for him here anymore. So the the refusal of the call is over and he has only one choice to to go forward on the adventure. Um, and that is the, the, the crossing of the first threshold. There's the point of no return, no going back. Uh, this is where the story starts to, to pick up steam and get fun. Um, again, in, in Save the Cat, um, this would be the the start of the second act. This is the fun and games section. This is the the meat. This is the adventure part that uh, starts to get exciting. Starts to get fun. You start to meet uh, start to meet other characters, enemies, allies. Your your character is test. Your hero is tested. Uh, they go through a series of trials. Um, maybe suffer defeat. Have small victories back and forth as they grow. Um, so in order to save the princess, and this is again, a, a very basic ancient story. Uh, the princess has been, been kidnapped, let's go save them. Uh, it's, in, it's in every Mario game. It's, you know, get, princess is in another castle. Um, it's a, a very basic story. Uh, so they're, they're setting off, set off to, uh, to go find the princess. And Obi-Wan and the droids uh, and Luke here have decided to go try to find uh, some kind of transport, uh, some kind of ship that will take them to uh, where the princess is being held captive. Um, they get pulled over by the cops. Uh, these aren't the droids you're looking for. Uh, they wander into a, a bar, uh, scum and villainy. Uh, this is... Step seven uh, would be the, the trials and, and the first failure. Um, Luke's, never, <laughs> Luke's never been in anything, uh, in any situation, anything like this. And uh, uh, he sticks out like a sore thumb. Sore thumb. Uh, the bartender says, we don't, uh, we don't take droids. I don't like your kind here. And uh, there's an altercation, uh, which Luke is... Uh, uh, thrown to the floor, uh, can't really defend himself, and Obi Wan has to step in uh, with the with the lightsaber, and uh, and protect him at this point. Uh, and step eight is the uh, meeting with the allies, uh, um, continuing to meet 
uh, more more characters along the journey, sidekicks or uh, other mentors in other ways. They meet uh, Han Solo here, who um, who shoots first, and uh, and they want passage to uh, in his ship up to uh, to rescue the princess. So they make allies with with Han and uh, Chewbacca, and. Uh, Get aboard the Millennium Falcon uh, en route to uh, to save the princess. Um, aboard the ship, um, I'd say step nine uh, occurs the uh, the growth and uh, a new skill. This is when this is when Obi Wan, um, the mentor, teaches Luke about uh, the Force. Teaches him about this energy that that flows through through everything in the universe um, and binds everything and, and has this, um, if, if you can control it, has this, uh, this power to manipulate um, everything, really. Um, so Luke is, is being trained here with a lightsaber for the first time. He's, uh, he's got this little floating ball that's flying around and shooting lasers at him that he's supposed to, to block, uh, and, he's, and he's doing terribly. Uh, until Obi Wan puts um, a helmet on him, a, a, a shield, so that he can't see, and encourages Luke to use the Force to 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 search with his feelings, and rather than than the physicality uh, of his of his eyes or reflexes, it's trying to uh, anticipate. And uh, use the force to uh, to stop this, and that's that's the first time Luke kind of feels uh, this power uh, of the of the Jedi Knight that that will uh, be necessary for him to uh, become the hero he needs to be to uh, to save the day. Uh, step ten uh, would be uh, the first success. The The Millennium Falcon is followed by the Empire, and um, some TIE fighters show up, and uh, Luke engages in his uh, first successful battle, um, able to uh, to shoot down uh, and defend themselves in the Millennium Falcon. Um, this is the first time we, we see him kind of stepping up and uh, displaying the potential that he has to to become the hero. Um, step 11 is beginning of the, the grand trial, the revelation and the insight. Um, they sneak, or they, uh, they're approaching the Death Star, the, the, the main battle station of the Empire. Um, of course, they think uh, the classic line is there's, that's no moon, that's a battle station. Or something th to those effects. Um, this is where the the princess, the castle. This is the castle that the princess is being ca held captive in. That the heroes will have to disguise themselves and sneak into, um, and rescue the princess from. Um, this I thought was funny. I don't know. Maybe I'm just maybe I'm reaching here, but I saw a circle, inside a circle, inside a circle. And then there's even on the Star Destroyer there, there's three, there's three circles for the engines. And I just thought it was very interesting uh, foreshadowing that Lucas came up that with the, the Empire uh, symbolized as three circles. And uh, <laughs> so Luke then finds where the princess is being held, ca held captive and um, they go through the uh, rescuing process by disguising themselves as the enemy. Um, I'm, I'm Luke Skywalker. I'm here to rescue. Aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper? Um, so after, after Han and Luke are able to uh, get the princess out of, out of prison, they, uh, they have, to have to plan the daring escape. And uh, through a, a laser battle, uh, they end up jumping into a trash compactor uh, to escape the lasers. Um, this is, again, this is a very 
common uh, thematic idea in storytelling. This would be metaphorically the um, the belly of the whale. Uh, they they call it. Uh, this is um, the belly of the beast. This is ultimate danger. This is mortality. This is um, in the Bible. This is Jonah being swallowed by the whale, or in Pinocchio, um, Geppetto. Uh, being trapped literally in the, <laughs> the belly of a whale. Um, so they have to find their way out of this. Uh, the droids uh, help them in doing so, and they successfully escape. Um, this is, I just love this idea of uh, kind of like an old pirate movie. <laughs> They're fly swinging for, uh, on ropes uh, from mast to mast um, in this. Uh, frenzy of escape. Um, this is the, again, the idea of, this is a, a, the battle, uh, the first interaction or the one and only interaction of Obi-Wan and Darth Vader where um, the idea of sacrifice of the hero comes, uh, comes up. I think uh, Obi-Wan says, if, if you strike me down, I'll become uh, more powerful than you can ever imagine. Um, in his destruction of the of the physical body, he becomes the spiritual element that is, um, through the power of the Force, uh, much more powerful than uh, than an old man with a sword. Um, and this idea of sacrifice, uh, self sacrifice, is repeated throughout again the the Christ Christ figure neo goes through the th the same idea in the matrix uh in the first one as well i think in the third one he's literally in a christ pose uh as he as he sacrifices himself for the good of his friends and humanity um step 13 of the hero's journey is uh the discarding of the old self this is this is this is the the realization that you're not a kid anymore. This is the realization that um, you have to you have to grow, you have to e evolve, and um, ascend to the next level, uh, so to speak. Um, which sets up uh, step fourteen: accepting of the new rule, um, and. You know, I, I'm I'm numbering these. Um, I've seen I've seen the hero's journey explained in many different terms. Orders switch around, verbiage different. Doesn't matter. Uh, this is you know very crash course. This is a basic understanding of of what it is uh, for the hero's journey. So there's there's many different interpretations or or versions of this, but um, for this sake. Uh, step 14 accepting of the new role so uh, they've had a uh, they've had a victory um, they've rescued the princess they've escaped the death star uh, they have uh, a kind of a, a moment of, of respite uh, they can they can enjoy a small uh, a rather large victory um, but the main main challenge is yet to is yet to face them uh, they've yet to overcome the main challenge. So, um, using the plans um, that R two D two is uh, stolen from, or they've hidden in R two D two from uh, um, the Empire, which is the catalyst for this entire story, is the stealing of these these Death Star plans. Uh, the rebellion has found uh, a weakness in in the space station of the Death Star. And so they assemble a, a small team of fighter pilots to uh, go into the Death Star and try and get a, a small uh, shot off with some missiles uh, and destroy this thing. I don't know why they would build a, des a, a space station that's easily destroyed with a, a missile, but hey, uh, <laughs> how else are you going to do it? Um, so Luke has accepted this new role 
uh, as as a pilot. He's he's gonna he's going to become uh, a pilot like his father, um, like like he's heard uh, his father was a great pilot. And you'll see in Luke's design here, he's starting to get rid of the kind of the white robes and take on the the military um, military garb, the fighter pilot um, aesthetic. And 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 you'll see he's literally got the uh, the Darth Vader uh, the Darth Vader box uh, has appeared for the first time um, in his design. Uh, I don't have an example right here, but if you look at the trilogy um, as a whole, Luke starts out in the in the the white cloak in the in Return of the Jedi or in Empire Strikes Back. In the second one, he's got more militaristic looking uh, tan outfit, and by the third one, he he has uh, an all black. Um, basically, he's gone from farm boy to Darth Vader, uh, aesthetically looking. Um, you know, I, I should have prefaced this that, you know, I'm, I'm telling the story of the hero's journey because, um, you know, we're, 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 it's tied into character design and the point of character design, uh, is to tell the story visually. Um, so understanding the basic structure of the story and understanding, um, you know, symbols, color, shape, and, and how that, how we react as humans to those elements visually um, is, is kind of the rules uh, for design and storytelling. And understanding those rules is, is how you can um, manipulate your audience to think what you want them to think or understand what you want want them to understand. Um, also, Luke's lightsaber starts out blue, ends up green, um, which is, uh, well, I didn't get into a color yet, and I don't think we will, but um, anyway, he starts to take on the idea or, or the shadow of, of Darth Vader. Luke starts become becoming more and more like his father. He's got some serious daddy issues, and that's understandable. Uh, in Empire or Empire Strikes Back, he goes into the the inner the inner cave where where fear and and the dragon uh, metaphorical dragon reside within himself, and he confronts his biggest fear, which is Darth Vader. He he does battle with himself and realizes um, you know when when the mask is removed, it is actually uh, himself that he's battling. Um, very cool metaphorical stuff going on there. Uh, step 15 um, is stepping up to the challenge. Uh, they've, the, the X-Wing fighter pilots are, are closing in on the, um, the final act here. This is the, uh, the third act ramping up. Um, so they have to uh, go to the Death Star, get the shields down, and uh, go into the trench and try and get off this one missile shot. Um, and of course, Darth Vader there in the middle, uh, his ship, they show up. Um, and yeah, I think he says something like, the force is strong with this one. He, he kind of feels Luke is different in some way. Um, this is kind of the the climactic the climactic moment um, of of the of the journey in this in this first film. Um, there have been a couple a couple other other X wings that were that went into the trench and shot off missiles uh, using the technology of the uh, the the gear to <laughs> the binoculars to try and see. Uh, I don't know what you call that. The uh, help me out here, anybody? Anyway, uh, he's he's trying to use the scope to uh, to land the shot, and and a couple of X wings have gone in before him and using the technology of mist. And this is this is kind of an overall theme of the film: um, this technology versus humanity, this um, nature versus machine. Um, 
theme that's present in in this in this film. Um, Luke overhears or, or hears the voice of of the deceased mentor Obi Wan, uh, who says, "You know, use your use the force. You, uh, use your use your feelings. Turn off turn off the machine. Use your use your consciousness. Use your your soul to to." to win this one. Uh, so Luke turns off the, uh, the gear and uses the force to guide, to guide the shot. Uh, it's a success. Uh, <laughs> step 15 success. Uh, I think that's actually from return of the Jedi, but, uh, the, uh, the other one, uh, image was less dramatic. Um, so the the Death Star goes down. The the villains are defeated, and our heroes escape. Um, I guess I, I did also forget to mention that um, Han Solo before before going into the final battle, Han Solo um, leaves with his. He's a mercenary. He's been paid to be there. Once his mission's over, he gets paid and he leaves. But um, and again, you can see in the duality of his of his his black vest and his white uh, undershirt, kind of this this duality. He's a slime, he's a scumbag, but he's got some uh, some good qualities to him. Um, and uh, he returns uh, just at the right time once he realizes that he's actually in it for more than money. He actually loves these people. Um, step fifteen, uh, the success continued. We. Uh, all our characters uh, come back together um, for one uh, a victorious uh, celebration. Step 16, restoring order uh, and balance uh, to the universe. Um, and you got a very balanced, symmetrical, order restored image right there. Um, and the... Uh, Step seventeen is 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 the return. It's the it's the the story has come full circle. We we've had Luke leave. He's he's gone through these trials, these tests. He's met all these these new characters who have helped him or hindered him along the way. He's overcome these tests and trials, and he's he has returned, come full circle uh, to to the place of, of origin. But he's he's coming with he's returning with with new lenses. He's returning with a new perspective, a new point of view, and new abilities, new a new outlook on life. Um, and that is that is, you know, essentially the that is the full circle of the hero's journey. And typical in these stories is once the once the the hero has has, has gone through the full journey, they they get to the end and they realize that whatever it is that they needed to succeed, they've possessed uh, the whole time. They've had it in them the whole the, the entire story. They just needed to go out there and learn that about themselves that they had it in them from the beginning. In Wizard of Oz, um, you know, Dorothy Dorothy gets to Oz. Meets all these characters, meets the scarecrow, the lion, the tin man, uh, and and realizes she wants to go home. And what's the way to get home? Click your heels three times. The ruby slippers. She's had the ruby slippers the entire time. She just needed to go through that process and and realize it and learn that. Um, you know, you you the scarecrow. If you if you're if you watch the Wizard of Oz. The scarecrow, his desire is to to have a brain. Um, but if you watch the film, he's the, always the one who has the ideas. Um, so all he was lacking was the confidence to say that, uh, <laughs> let's go this way. Um, and of course, Luke had the force within him the entire time. He just needed to know how to uh, manipulate that. Right. Ooh, this didn't age well. Uh, <laughs> as long as you keep uh, 
his wife's name out of your mouth, you're, you're fine. Uh, the hero, um, men in black here. Um, I, I, I said I'd talk a little bit about these uh, Jungian archetypes. So, as I mentioned before, uh, Carl Jung was a Swiss um, psychologist who, also an amazing artist and writer uh, in his own right, um, wrote a book called The Liber Novus, or, or The Red Book, where he um, kind of wrote down all his dreams and, and illustrated them, and uh, people have been studying that for, for many years. Uh, I think he was also a contemporary of Joseph Campbell, as well as uh, Sigmund Freud, and uh, sure, they had some amazing conversations. But uh, so Jung came up the, with the idea that, that there's, much like the hero's journey, there's there's these motifs that, that happen in every story. Um, so the hero, we've already gone over the hero um, quite extensively, um, but Jay here in, in Men in Black is the hero. Um, and again, you know, they, they, they're, they're empathetic, their desire, um, and the, the, their desire for the gold drives the narrative, um, and we relate to them uh, in some way. Um, again, the mentor, we talk about Obi-Wan uh, or Yoda, um, this is Glinda the Good Witch from uh, Wizard of Oz. Um, Morpheus from The Matrix, Dumbledore. These, this is the character, or the ar ar archetype of the character who, who, guides, who guides the hero. Um, the person who is knowledgeable about the extraordinary world outside of the, uh, the status quo of the, of the hero's uh, stasis. Um, the ally, uh, this is, of course... Sam Wise uh, from Lord of the Rings, kind of the sidekick character, the, the character that will always uh, help, <laughs> help, our, help our hero to achieve their goal. And um, um, yeah, you've got, uh, I mean, like I said, they're, they're sidekicks, um, friends, people who are on the journey along with the hero and help them out um, in many ways companionship as well as getting out of of uh of trials and tribulations um the herald is is yeah the catalyst uh the catalyst for the story um not always a character um but the inciting um the reason for them going on the journey the, the r2d2 with the with the message um would be a herald character um, and this is the, this is the reason, uh, that they're, that they're going on this journey. Uh, this is from, uh, the images from Spirited Away, uh, Miyazaki film where the infected boar, uh, comes, uh, into the, uh, the village that Ashitaka lives in and, uh, essentially, uh, infects him with, um, the greed of humanity or whatever he's been poisoned with from this, um, this bullet that's been shot into him. Ashitaka becomes uh, poisoned himself, is then banished from his village. That's another very common uh, theme that the hero is banished. That's one of the reasons they have to go on the adventure and accept the, the call to action is that they're no longer welcome uh, in their home until they, uh, they do right. Um, the trickster, this is the, uh, Dobby from Harry, Harry Potter. This is often the, the comic relief or the character that, um, you know, as it says, offers an outside perspective and, uh, and it says here, yeah, also great for lamp shading. Lamp shading is, um, when you <laughs> typically when you have a hole in the story or there's something that has been written poorly and you can't figure out a way to write out of it, you kind of put a lampshade on it and have a, the trickster character say, well, isn't that kind of dumb? And then the audience is like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, at least they're aware of it. Um, the shapeshifter, uh, this is um, typically a, a, 
a character with with a duality, a, a character who a chameleon type character that comes in to the story, you believe one thing about them, and then they it is revealed that they actually uh, their motives are not what you thought. They were they are not who uh, you expected. This is uh, Elsa from uh, uh, Indiana Jones: Last Crusade. She uh, the the love interest in the third Indiana Jones film, who uh, we realize by the end is a Nazi. Uh, that's a twist. Um, the Guardian character. <laughs> this is an image from uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. You've got the uh, the Black Knight, um, the Threshold Guardian. Um, you know this is the uh, this is the character typically. Um, you know when the when the hero crosses that 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 first threshold they'll they'll run into some kind of obstacle you know answer me these questions three um some kind of uh gatekeeper um if you want to proceed in the hero's journey you must defeat me or uh, outwit me in some way and uh, and of course the shadow um the shadows are are the villains yes <laughs> um you know, this is the big bad. This is the uh, this is the Darth Vader, the Voldemort, the yeah Sauron. Um, this is the 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 number one enemy that the hero must overcome. That, in many ways, exemplifies the the opposite of of the hero character. Um, again, this is yeah, this is from that scene I was talking about in uh in empire strikes back when when luke ventures into the innermost cave and finds that his biggest fear uh is his father or in, and in many ways uh himself or the the aspects of himself that are going to uh if he continues down that path uh ultimately bring about his demise. All right. Um, are there any questions right now? I mean, I'll I'll take Q and A and, and try and do like a little uh, a little demo uh, at the at the end. But um, yeah, I wanted to um, take a break from talking for a second. <laughs> um, but I I will uh, next. I'll show you kind of. Um, something that I've been working on uh, personally that has been, I guess, my own personal hero's journey into um, storytelling or, um, you know, art for entertainment. Um, yeah, Chris, I think Chris mentioned that, yeah, I'm a multi, uh, multi-platform original IP I've been working on for many years. Um, yeah, I, I guess I started it Honestly, uh, probably when I was in college, like started thinking about it or started um, really gearing up towards this or kind of, I guess it kind of started as more like, like a feeling, like, like this world that existed that sometimes I would get images from, but I didn't really understand uh, what that meant. So this was my kind of journey and starting to jot it down, starting to write it down, starting to design it and flesh out this world building and these characters and the story. Um, and it's called Sleepwalker. Um, so this is a, a, a kind of a pitch Bible I, I just wrapped up a couple weeks ago. Um, and I'll take you through a little bit of it. Um, an extraordinary voyage in the human, human unconscious. It's, it's very much about, uh, it's very much the hero's journey. Uh, you know, this is my application of everything I've, been learning um, in entertainment design, and it's it's my uh, my proof of concept. Um, so this is this story is very much about dreams. It's about consciousness and unconsciousness. Uh, it's about uh, another world, just like the hero's journey. You have the stasis of the waking world, and you have uh, the dream world uh, in all its extraordinariness. Uh, yeah, very much like the Matrix. Um, but essentially there's uh, a kid named Finnegan, um, 
also it takes place in 1994 Pacific Northwest. Uh, a kid named Finnegan who uh, is a lucid dreamer. He has the ability to become conscious of the dream state and has the ability uh, to control it. And is that me? It is me. Um, <laughs> and and so um, you know this is kind of the this is kind of the kitchen sink for all the all the ideas I've had or all the characters I've or worlds I've wanted to ideas I've wanted to play with that were either you know right not right for uh, mainstream media they were too risque or or too weird or whatever this is kind of the kitchen sink for for all those ideas that never found a home um, in mainstream products that I've worked on. Um, so again, some influences, a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the things I talked about in the, in the hero's journey, uh, lecture will obviously inspired, uh, sleepwalker. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess the log line would be, um, a lucid dreamer must embark upon a numinous adventure, uh, to save the consciousness of family trapped in a nightmarish loop. Uh, Finnegan's parents are uh, neuroscientists who are studying dreams and consciousness. And uh, when the story, when we open up into the story, uh, his parents are both, uh, have been in a coma for the last two months. Um, supposedly from a car crash, but we learn later, uh, there's something more uh, at foot. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, it's this, it's this huge epic that I've been working on, but I tried to kind of boil it down to what is it really about. And I think I landed on, <laughs> uh, it's about growing up and it's about friendship and particularly friendships between habitual loners, dreamers, outcasts coming together uh, as family. Um, these are some, some influences, some inspirations. Um, I love the film Stand By Me. Um, I grew up uh, in Oregon, uh, in rural Oregon, um, and very much relate to uh, buddies going on adventures out in the woods. Uh, no bodies being found, but uh, that's good. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, this, like I said, the story uh, starts out with Finnegan in, in the in the rig, in the real world, in the very dreary Pacific Northwest, rainy. Um, World of Asteria. Asteria, the um, a fictional world. Uh, Asteria is the the goddess of nighttime divinations, and everything thematically in this story is very much about dreams and sleep, and um, kind of that's kind of the through line or the the web that ties everything together. Um, so, like I said, uh, he has the ability to control uh, the dream world, um, and his parents are in a coma. So we, we, we meet this character uh, and he is living with his grandmother and he's bummed out. Um, of course, in the dream world, oh, there's that again. Uh, in the dream world, he is nothing short of a superhero. He can, he can do um, whatever. He's, he's limited only by his imagination. And in, in, the, in the waking world, he is always getting in trouble for daydreaming and doodling. He wants to be a comic book artist when he grows up. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he's limited in the, in the dream world only, only by his imagination. So, um, yeah, he, again, kind of, like, uh, kind of like Han Solo. He has a little bit of a duality. He's a little bit of a, a prankster, a trickster. Um, in the in the dream world, he has this this blue shock of hair. Um, his mother is of Maori, uh, New Zealand Maori descent, so his the symbol on his chest is uh, like a fish hook, uh, a jade carved Maori fish hook. Um, when he becomes lucid, he has uh, this haka. He calls it haka power. He has this ability uh, of the Maori uh, to to uh to have this superpower and then of course he, he has a an orange cape and uh he rides a dinosaur uh named wake uh finnegan and wake 
little nod to um, James Joyce. Um, but he's got this uh, orange cape and a and a and a and a dinosaur, um, which is essentially. I mean, I shouldn't say that, right? It's 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 Mario and um, and Yoshi, uh, essentially. So he he has a lot of he's playing with a lot of things because he is a fan of pop culture uh, from the early '90s or late '80s uh, himself. So a lot of those power fantasies in the dream world. Uh, a lot of his interests carry over. Um, this is uh, this is an ally, Jimmy, uh, also from the Waking World, and he's uh, he's a guitar player. Um, and you know his his story is much more of adult themed. Uh, he's he's pretty much the only black kid in this small Pacific Northwest town in the '90s. Uh, grunge is very grunge music is very big at the time. He wants to be a rock star. Um, he doesn't have any uh, biological family that he knows of. He's been in and out of foster care um, his whole life. And um, Finnegan and, and him have a very much a, a older brother, younger brother dynamic. That's her, how they um, feel about each other. Uh, they're the only ones that understand uh, each other. Um, this is Lucy. She is... Uh, She's this mysterious girl uh, hidden away in uh, kind of this in-between. It's in the dream world, in the dream universe, but it's in this kind of hidden away in this, in this world between the waking world and the dream universe called Hypnagogia. And uh, she's been hidden away the, in this lighthouse. Um, her story will uh, be revealed. But um, yeah, visually, visually speaking, she's she's. She's in this kind of half waking, half asleep, half dead, half alive world where there is no there's no indication of time. There's no indication of there's no sun and day. It's always dark. It's always stars. Um, and the only. Uh, she does uh, have a power, this power of lucidity as well, very much like the power of the force, understanding or Neo's control of the matrix is this, this idea or this ability to control the, the dream universe, manipulate dream matter. Um, and really the only way to, she's a redhead when she goes into this world and, the, uh, and she knows that her hair grows about six inches a year. Uh, but in the dream, in this, in this in-between world, her hair grows out white. Uh, so the only indication of how long she's been there is by measuring her hair. Um, so it's red at the tips and then six inches for every year that she's been there. Um, so uh, Finnegan in one of his sleepwalking uh, f uh, episodes uh, is, is sucked into the dream world uh, by Lucy who's, who's trying to escape. Uh, herself and uh, Finnegan and Jimmy are are absorbed in the into the into the dream universe. This is very much the um, uh, the the crossing of the of the first threshold um, from the hero's journey, and now they are they are stuck. Um, and uh, Lucy's biggest fear, which is this boat that transfers the consciousness of children from childhood to adulthood or, or teen, teenager um, that passes by every month transporting the consciousness of souls um, from Pillow Town, the land of childhood dreams, to, uh, to the next stage of life, uh, passes by her lighthouse uh, every month and she hides from it. Uh, but the, she, she, she knows deep down that's probably the only way of escaping, um, answering the call for her is to sneak aboard this, this ship and uh, exit. So Lucy and the boys hatch this plan to sneak aboard. It's called the Stradivaria. Um, it's oars um, are like, uh, like a violin bow. Uh, there are strings lining the, the boat. And every time it rows, it makes a creepy, makes some creepy music. Uh, so you can hear that coming from a, a ways off. 
Um, so they, uh, they sneak aboard the Stradivaria and their idea is to sneak into Pillow Town to find the sheriff whom they believe can get them home uh, to the waking world. Uh, and it will be revealed why they think that. But um, so they successfully uh, sneak aboard the Stradivaria. Across the universe, uh, across the dream universe, is the, the nightmare world of Boogityville. This is the, um, the world of nightmares. Uh, everything you can think of, uh, kind of, I can't wait. I haven't designed every part of this yet and I can't wait to, um, because I want to take all the classic fears, you know, people's teeth falling out, uh, being chased by wasps, uh, facing a bully and just throwing rubber, rubber haymakers, uh, <laughs> all those, all those classic dream uh, nightmare ideas uh, will be uh, instilled into the into this world. Um, so the idea is it's powered by dreams. So there's a a, a bear, a Darth Vader type character who abducts children uh, or dreamers from across the dream universe and brings them to Boogityville, sits them in the chair, and like kind of like Dark Crystal has their uh, their essence or their dreams pulled from their minds or, or the, from their, their souls. It's more, um, more of their ambitions, right? Their dreams. What do you want to do with your life? What do you want to be? Um, this chair. It's very much a metaphor for, um, you know, a desk job, uh, sitting in the chair and having your dreams <laughs> ripped from you. But, um, so there, there has to be some, uh, some humor involved in this, um, to uh to offset the darkness but just that's always i like to go dark with it but i also like uh like it to be some kind of twisted humor to everything so it's not just purely scary so this is the uh this is the the princess of of boogityville she's um this over the top uh villain who who has absolutely no empathy um for any of the abducted children uh in her world and and once she steals their dreams they kind of become crazy uh insane little clown people um so she's stealing their dreams to power her world um the teens jimmy finnegan and and lucy sneak into pillow town uh which is the land of childhood dreams um it's kind of this place where all of the uh collective unconscious of humanity all the ideas uh, all the forgotten dreams uh go to live forever you know what happens to your dreams when you have a crazy dream you wake up you start going about your day and you said i had a crazy dream where did that go or i had a dream of what i wanted to do where did that go uh, pillow town is the land of sweet dreams or the land of childhood dreams um so Finnegan realizes this is kind of a real place and he's remembering uh, going here and uh, having a little potluck uh, with, with his friends as kids. Um, this, this took a long, a, lo a long time, but it was really, really fun. Um, kind of throwing a bunch of Easter eggs and here you know, building this world. Um, Actually, I actually uh, reopened this painting uh, after COVID started. Um, it had this big spread. This is a big horizontal spread that would be across two pages. Um, but I opened this painting up uh, after my job ended uh, working for a VR, VR company uh, for Sony. And I uh, opened this painting up and started working on it and just throwing in uh, a million things. I printed up a puzzle, a uh, 2000 piece puzzle that was super fun. And uh, we worked on that uh, as a family during, uh, during COVID. Uh, this is the Sheriff of Pillow Town. This is, this is the mentor character. This is the Obi-Wan. This is the Morpheus. And that's uh, uh, my buddy Kirk Thatcher there, who I always thought would be a fantastic voice actor for this character. Um, so the sheriff is uh, is 
I'm very familiar with, uh, he's kind of, he kind of watches over Pillow Town. Pillow Town is, um, is also like the, like the nightmare world. It's also powered by dreams, but, um, it's powered by dreams, uh, when people are sleeping, um, and they're ab absorbed in this catching sphere the, and used to power the world, uh, and keep up the, um, there's kind of a force field. Um, I mean, the whole pillow town has got a metaphor for childhood, um, and there's a force field around it that needs, requires dreams to, uh, to keep it working. So the sheriff, uh, makes sure that everyone is in bed by midnight and, um, and if they're not, uh, he, he gets snuggled in a blanket jail. And, uh, so he watches over everyone. Uh, so after the, the teenagers sneak into, uh, pillow town, which they're not supposed to do once you leave, once you leave childhood, you're not supposed to return. Um, but they do, they sneak in and they go, uh, they go steal some, uh, some dream cycles from the dream police. Um, I was imagining this sequence where cheap, cheap trick dream police is being played as they fly through the city, waking up everyone and keeping them, keeping them up, keeping them from dreaming. Uh, so the shields are down uh, surrounding Pillow Town, and uh, the queen or the princess sends sends the bed bugs to bite. Uh, these giant creatures chew through the bl great blanket of of Pillow Town, gobble up all these. Uh, little kids, all these dreamers, uh, to then take back to the nightmare world and harvest their, their energy, their, their, um, their essence and their, their youthful ambition. Um, so this is very much, um, you know, kind of where this is where, uh, the story really starts. They, the, the teens feeling guilty, uh, that they have, <laughs> pretty much destroyed Pillow Town and had uh, allowed all of the uh, citizens to be abducted, um, go off on a journey to uh, to circumvent the uh, a labyrinth of dreams and and go on the the hero's journey. Um, and they're they're boarding uh, the Third Eye Express here. I always thought it would be very cool to have a silhouette. Um, of this train emerging from clouds. And then as you get closer, as the camera approaches, you realize that the, the smokestack is actually a guy with a big hat, a conductor, uh, and that the uh, smoke is from a cigar and the cow catcher on the train is teeth. And as the, the cars, all the train cars go back in space, you see all these uh, insane, <laughs> insane, uh, train cars. So they board, they board the train. Um, yeah, a little background on the, on the waking world, the town that Finnegan lives in. Um, I love making maps. I love, uh, <laughs> creating, uh, these narratives. Um, this is the, the map of pillow town and, um, yeah. And the shadow. So, there you go. Uh, it's about all I have for uh, for that. I, I'll uh, I'll open up for Q and A, and um, I was going to. Uh, I don't. How much time do we have left, Chris? Uh, looks like we have a little a little over thirty minutes. Two hours. Okay, perfect. Um, but before we get into Q and A, yeah. Hey, thanks. That was really great. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I started off a little uh, a little slow. I haven't been public speaking for many years. <laughs> that was that was fantastic. Uh, so it, it, we have some questions from uh, Twitch and, and the YouTubes and, and and Facebook. But do any of y'all here have any questions for uh, Cameron? Yes. Here, hold on to the cube of communication. Cube of communication. I like that. Thank you. Oh, wow. That's cool. It is cute. <laughs> um, I, I find it really cool to, uh, 
when I when I started going to Nonum, I did a character design camp, and you were my teacher. Oh, so and I don't know if you remembered. <laughs> uh, you you gave me the assignment to combine Lilo and Stitch and Highlander. Oh, that's uh, awesome! I do remember you. Yeah, a Very long talented. time ago. Uh, wow, that's cool. Yeah, but no, I remember <laughs> Lilo and Stitch and Highlander. Yeah. I still have the drawing. That's a tough one. There can be only one. There can be only one. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I remember, like, seeing your concept art for, you know, Sleepwalker back then. right. And I just wanted to ask, like, how long have you been working on this idea? Because, like, I don't know. It's, like, a really big world uh, that's really cool to see. And, like, it seems you have most of it thought out. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think it really really has just come together, like, in the last year or so. But. Gosh, I, I started consciously working on it. I think I started designing the sheriff for as the first character. He was a, actually originally the main protagonist of the hero. Um, uh, I think I started in 2006. <laughs> so it's taking a long time. But yeah, it's uh, Deep Waters as a, uh, my mentor, my Obi-Wan, uh, Sean Thanjetti. Uh, said slow uh, deep waters move slowly uh, and I have a very rich uh, world that I've been building um, but yeah long time <laughs> but that being said um, you know I'm, I'm I'm ready it's ready to leave the nest I'm ready to get others other people involved it's it's I think I've taken it about as far as I can <laughs> alone or that I, I want to take it alone so ready to go but that's so cool. Good to see you. What uh, what year are you in now? Oh, okay. Nice. Hi, Cam. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm over here all the way in the back. <laughs> um, I was also a student of yours when you used to teach here at Norman Character wow. Design. I think it was your last term, actually. All right. Who has not a, been a, stu- a student? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a great class that you taught. Like... Um, yeah, I remember like our assignment was just like to make like a sea monster that I think you drew and we had to do our own iteration of it. <laughs> and then we had to do like a mushroom character or warrior or something like that. Um, and then I even remember like here at Noman in the library, they have your Sleepwalker book. I think oh. it was like volume one or, one or two. Uh, yeah, I think they still have it. That's um, cool. <laughs> but um, no, it's great to see you again, dude. It's like you look, it's really cool. Um, Thanks for coming out. Like my question is, is like... Um, this I'm pretty sure this happens to everyone, but like artist block or like I guess you could say the MIPS when you're like there's something that like you're really good at, you know, like you could draw a face, but then there's that one day where you just can't, you know, for some reason you're just like, I don't know, like what's going on? Like mm-hmm. I guess how in your personal experience, how do you get over that, you know, that artist block? How do I deal with artist block? Um honestly, a lot of times I will I know exactly what you're talking about as far as some days you just can't draw. It's super weird. Uh, but I think it's very much like like a, an athlete, you know, warming up for a competition or whatever, you know, before a basketball game, you know, Steph Curry goes out there and warms up and shoots and shoots and shoots. Um, the warm-up is so important. Um, you know, just trying to jump right in it and, you know, you're – you're pressed for time. You need a final, you need to do it now. Um, is like, I, I've been doing this all my life. I've been drawing all my life. I think I'm pretty good at it, but I can't just j- jump right into it. I got to warm up. And sometimes, like you said, there's artist block or something's just not clicking in your head. There's something missing there. I'll just start writing. I'll just start. Um, I'll, I'll just start writing in a sketchbook, physically writing down in text in a, in a, in a, in a sketchbook on a page. And I'll just start writing today's date, where I'm at, what the weather is. And then I'll just kind of let the unconscious or the sub subconscious come out on the page. And before I know it, I'm doodling, um, something I want, something I want to be doing, you know, it'll just, I'll just start doodling something. Your hand will get warmed up. Your connection between your brain and your hand will become one. And then 
things will get better. Um, yeah, that's for, that's my process anyway. I just start writing and don't try to don't, don't overthink things. Yeah. Um, well, um, thanks for coming. That was awesome. Honestly, the, the sleepwalker <laughs> project and following that as someone who's been working on a project for so long, how is it that you can keep going basically? <laughs> it's like after working for so many, so many years, how do you not get bored of working on the same thing? Sometimes I do, honestly. Um, sometimes I got to shelve it. Sometimes I got to put it away for months at a time. Um, you know, like I said, it's that project is my personal journey. That's my personal hero's journey. That's something that um, chose me. And it's something that I just am compelled to work on. Um, you know, if I, I always say like, you know, if I would, even if no one ever saw it, I would probably still be doing that. So that's something I'm lucky that I have that self-motivation to, to do that or, or to work on that project. But it's also like, um, you know, it's a tool for me to, to get better at other things. When I started, I didn't know anything about story structure or, or design or, you know, I, I had gone to school, but I didn't know, um, I didn't know much about life, uh, honestly. And I was trying to tell a story about life. So, um, I needed to live, uh, first and foremost. And then, yeah, like I said, sometimes I don't have any interest in, or I don't have any burning desire. And I need to go and do some other thing. I need to work on another project. I need to focus on work. I need to, to do something that's completely 180 from that. Um, and then I don't know, just one day I'll wake up and be like, I can't wait to work on sleepwalker. I can't wait to, to open up that pillow town piece and throw in some little crazy character, uh, flying around on a bed car or something like, um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I wouldn't, um, put too much pressure, um, you know, for, especially for a personal project, I wouldn't put too much pressure on work on it from this time to this time every day. Um, kind of let inspiration, let the muse work through you. Uh, when that when that time comes. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming. And your work is so beautiful, and I just want to see it in like a movie. <laughs> thank you. I'm like, what? Uh, Appreciate that. I have like two questions. I was wondering, first of all, um, have you always been a visual artist? And then also, have you ever dabbled in 3D? <sighs> Gosh. Um, I would, yes, I would say I'm, I, I've always been a visual artist ever since I could, you know, hold a pencil. Um, I actually, I'm super fortunate that I had, um, an amazing high school art teacher who encouraged me, uh, to, um, pursue art as a career, um, you know, and very supportive parents, which is right there, two things that very few people have. So I'm very fortunate to uh, have that kind of support. Um, 3D. I love sculpting traditionally. Um, and it's so embarrassing. But uh, I get so bogged down by the technology. Um, and it kills me. It's, it's so embarrassing to, to say that, especially here, where there's so many amazing sculptors. And this is literally a school for teaching tech, tech. And, uh, I'm just, so I, that's my, that's my, that's my dragon in the, in the inner cave is overcome tech, overcoming technology. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm very embarrassed to answer that question, but, uh, I say it every day. My, la <laughs> my lady will attest. I got to learn ZBrush. I got to learn ZBrush. And then Blender comes out. I got to learn Blender. I got to learn Blender. And then, you know, something else comes out. And I'm like, oh, that's going to be even easier. I uh, actually took an Unreal, uh, an Unreal class, but uh, it was too much for me at that time. Like, I, I, I have a hard time um, learning new programs when another person is not right next to me being like, oh, don't get too frustrated. Stop just push this button. I'm like, oh, 
I think I just don't have enough patience uh, <laughs> for sucking at something at this point. <laughs> like, but uh, yes, I need to learn it. Mm -hmm. Unless you uh, want to work, uh, <laughs> you want to work in tandem. And are you a sculptor? Okay, all right. <laughs> Teach me. <laughs> Hi, Cameron. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you. I have a question. Um, of the archetype characters, do you find one of them to be more challenging to write about than the others to flesh out story with? Uh, are you, the question was... Um, of, what, of, oh, there we go. Of, of the characters in the archetypes, uh -huh. is there any one archetype that's more challenging to write about, to write a story for? Right. Um, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Um, hmm. Gosh. I don't know. I, I, I guess I've maybe uh, I'll start with the opposite. It's easier to write about characters that have gone through what you've gone through. Um, you know, they say, write what you know. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess the characters that maybe have, are, are something that I can't relate to personally, um, would be, would be more difficult for me. Um, like the, uh, the, the, the Lucy character, I've never been, uh, a young uh, female. And so I would, I mean, I would love to get a woman writer to help me flesh out that character because it's, I never had sisters. I never was that. And I don't want it to ring false. I want it to be, uh, you know, relatable. I want it to be real. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, that's not an archetype, but is it is what I would say is the more, most challenging for me is is writing, trying to write those characters that I uh, can't as easily get into the head of. I guess Does that answer the question. <laughs> All right, Cameron. So we have some questions from the internet as well. But before we get to that, I had a quick question for you. Uh, we heard about block. I mean, heard about the hero's journey, you creating a lot of your process. But when you sit down, like how you're about to sit down right now, if we all weren't here, what is your process? Do you work in silence? Do you turn on some serious metal music? Do you eat a cheesecake <laughs> all by yourself and then you start getting to it? Like what – how do you go about your process? So what, is it? what is it? <laughs> um, yeah. Honestly, um, you know, when I when – I, there's a couple of answers to that. Uh, I do love metal music. Uh, <laughs> I love uh, I love listening to uh, to lectures. I love learning. Um, I love listening to to audio books. Um, you know, being able to read while you're mindlessly rendering something is awesome. That's like <clears throat> I know kung fu. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I do. I do blast music uh, for sure. Um, one of the, I do a lot of, um, I still do a lot of traditional pencil on paper, pen on ink on paper. Um, and one of the things I've found is odd, uh, is, is being in a very busy public space at a bar, at a coffee shop, at a restaurant, on a subway. Um, and being inspired by all the, the visuals around you, all the sounds, smells, whatever, um, it's just this stream of conscious and just, and just kind of observing, observing as a fly on the wall. I like to put in headphones. If you don't have headphones, people start talking to you. Oh, oh are you drawing? <laughs> that's, that's, uh, sometimes that's cool, but other times it's like, you just, I, like, I'm, I just want to. To space out here or sometimes i'll just uh like i'll wear big headphones 
with no music and just listen to people talk and uh, just tap my foot like I'm listening. That way they, they, they become acclimated to you and they don't, they don't see you as someone who's eavesdropping, which is that exactly what you're doing. Um, <laughs> hearing natural dialogue between two people um, is uh, who don't think you're listening. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, it's one of the hardest things of writing is, getting a natural dialogue. So listening to that is kind of fun. But yeah, I, I love, I absolutely love being in a crowded space, introverted in a crowded space, um, quiet in a room, in the chair. Uh, gosh, it feels like a prison uh, <laughs> a lot of times. And, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's my process. I like being, being in a noisy place. <laughs> So it, it, then it kind of goes into uh, how you were talking about Sleepwalker. In order for you to really get into it, you had to live life. So even part of your process is in a way living life because you're out there. You're in your own way interacting Absolutely. by eavesdropping and stuff like that. That's kind of cool. Yeah, so that like was that, that's actually an important uh, part of, uh, I guess, my journey that I didn't, uh, I didn't touch upon. Um, I was, um, you know, super lucky. I was working. I was I was the character designer uh, for Guitar Hero Three, Four, Five, Aerosmith, Metallica. Uh, you know, we got rock stars coming into the office. We're getting we're getting paid well. We're getting royalty checks. Um, and I came to this point where where Sleepwalker was already very much something that was getting in the way of, of my sleep. Sure. Uh, you know, I would come home after working all day and then I just wanted to work on, on Sleepwalker. I want to work on my personal project. I'd be up till I'd be super inspired right around midnight, one o'clock in the morning. I'm like, let's go. And then four, four in the morning would come around and I got, I got to wake up pretty soon and go to work. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I came to this crossroads of, you know, I could go, down what I felt was the safe path. I could go down the corporate world. I could move up to lead, to art director, to blah, 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 and, you know, be a seen as successful in that industry. Um, but I also came to this point, like, if I do that, um, you know, I, I didn't have kids. I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't have student debt. I didn't have all these things. That's why I said I, I have this a lot of freedom uh, to pursue what I want to do. And if I don't do that, if I go down the easy path, um, I think I'll always regret it. And I also realized that I was writing about a story about life and that I didn't know shit. <laughs> I didn't know anything uh, about life, uh, really. I was, you know, 23, 24. Um, at that time. So yeah, right, right around 25, I decided to, to quit my job and work on Sleepwalker full time. Obviously I did not think I would be <laughs> working on it so unsuccessfully for this long, but I, obviously it had to happen. That's just, that's the journey that I had to go on to create that thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to tell you, uh, you know, what to think about your own stuff, but uh, I tried drawing yesterday and it didn't look nearly as good as uh, <laughs> anything that you showed up on that screen. So that is that looks like success to me. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> on on the other side of living life, let's talk about a very hot topic right now. So this comes from the internets. Uh, what do you think AI is going to be for the artist tool set? I know it's a question that comes up a lot, literally every time we have one of these sure. events, that it's a question that comes up. So I figured we just kind of ripped the bandaid off now and of then to the other questions. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, obviously it's my opinion. Um, uh, no one can see the future, but I, don't see it going away. Uh, I think it's here. It's here to stay. Um, 
I think it will be utilized in every creative pipeline um, everywhere uh, across the board. Um, you know, my, my real only, my real issue with it uh, is just how it was built and generated on the hard work, stealing from the you know, artists who uh, created the artwork, scraped the internet for imagery, and then use that to, in turn, harm the artists with their own hard work. Um, I was working for an ad agency. Um, that's how I paid the bills. Uh, I was doing concepts and sketches for, uh, for movie posters and billboards and advertising for films and video games. And, um, yeah, I started seeing, I started seeing AI images in the reference they were providing me. And literally the next week they stopped calling me and haven't called back since, um, artists or any profession being replaced by technology is nothing new. Uh, it will continue to happen. Uh, I think it's coming for us all in one way or another. Um, you know, this is, uh, a very interesting time. Um, but yeah, I, I think we have to adapt with it, whatever that means. Uh, I really don't think, you know, the genie's out of the bottle, the Pandora's box is open and it's not going, it's not going back and it's not going away. So um, if we want to continue doing what we do, we have to learn to, uh, to use it. Um, yeah. I think that's as good as answer as any, <laughs> and, it, and it provides some insight, which is really good. So, aside from talking about Skynet, uh, as in you, you were giving a lot of examples up there about uh, you know different characters, character arcs, the hero journey, so on and so forth. Um, but presentation aside, personal opinion only, who's the most interesting character with the greatest arc to you? Uh, of all time? Uh, of all, the goat. The oh, goat of, of the hero's journey. <laughs> oh, jeez. Is that we, a question from the internet? Do I, it, yeah, it was, from, it was from the internet. Oh, man, internet. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know what that person thinks. Yeah, should I we come get, back in an hour? I got to get some time to, to think about that one. All of the, I feel like if you gave me a smaller, uh, some kind of a... a box to uh to break out of creatively i could figure that out but so uh so broad there's so many stories there's so many great characters there's so many great arcs so um, then let's let's uh let's spin it into a different way what makes you interested in a character and their arc like what is something that when it when it happens you're like yep there it is that's that's going to be in my top 10 or top 20 of my most favorite characters Right. Um, gosh, I mean, like I said, uh, doing something unexpected or, I mean, it has to be, still be within their realm. It can't be just like completely left wall, left, like left turn from their personality, but um, doing something unexpected, doing, you know, like I said, the bigger arc, the better uh, for for those super interesting characters. Um, gosh, <laughs> that's another tough one. What is the thing that they would do? That would... Anybody Anybody else uh, have an answer for that one? Throw something out there. I'll, I'll run with it. Just, just yell it out. You don't even need the cube. Sure. Yeah, something that's more uh, morally ambiguous or you don't know. Uh, how that's going to play out? Sure, of course. That's uh, that's that's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> we have a uh, really good participation here today, which is great. Uh, so another question is: How did you come up with designs for characters for Guitar Hero or Barbaria? Barbaria, yeah, yeah. yeah I didn't talk about that. Um, <laughs> Out now on Oculus Rift, soft release. Um, um, yeah, Barbaria was a was a I was a small studio, small startup um, VR company 
uh, where I was art directing a small team as well as designing the characters, coming up with the world, world building, coming up with the narrative. Uh, it was very much, uh, very much Conan the Barbarian meets Mad Max Fury Road um, as far as the tone and the aesthetic and the style. Um, but we also wanted to, to, you know, infuse humor. And um, so it was, uh, it was a, a small, a uh, small team of uh, game designers and tech artists who came up with this, um, you know, you got the sticks and the goggles and uh, it's a melee hack em up barbarian world um, where they also had the ability to shoot arrows and, and use all these uh, weapons and stuff. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was super cool. Um, obviously we, 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 we had these archetypal barbarian, um, male barbarian, female barbarian, wizard, sorcery, this high fantasy type of tropes and, and archetypes to work from. So there was a lot that's already been, been done that I could pull from and kind of skew, um, in our, our twisted sense of humor or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I mean, obviously the first thing I'm doing when I get any assignment is I'm reading, I'm researching, I'm scouring the internet or trying to think of everything that I've ever seen that fits into that, into that, um, that script or that structure, that, that world. Um, and yeah, particularly like in, in Guitar Hero, uh, I came into the third one. Uh, it was the first time it was moving from PS2 uh, to PS3, and it was the first time that it was going to Xbox. So there was a next gen up in the resolution and the technology that we could work with. So some of the, some of the things we could make look better. Um, that being said, um, you know, I'm... As soon as, we, as soon as we got the the call to make that game, I was I went home and stayed up all night with a reference folder, just dropping in images, listening to music, reading everything I could about these bands, about these people, just going down the rabbit hole on literally anything I could find that I thought was cool in music. I play guitar. I have written music, um, so it was already of a personal interest to me uh, that genre and. Yeah, you know, especially with, you know, something like a genre of music, uh, which there's such hardcore fans uh, that already love that thing. If you come in and just pull aesthetically, like, I'm going to take the shoulder pads from black metal and I'm going to take this the, the plaid pants from punk and I'm going to build a character that's people are going to call bullshit on that. <laughs> They're going to say, dude, what are you doing? You, so you got to know that's, that's honestly, that's like one of my most favorite parts about this is the research going down, really understanding like the history of, of Norwegian black metal or corpse paint or whatever. And then, and then applying that to the characters after you know where it came from, what is. Uh, there's going to be even more events coming up. As, as so you can follow us on social and stay up to date with Nomen. But Cameron, if we want to stay up to date with you, where should where should we go? That's those same internets that I've been talking about. Those all things, evening. yeah. Uh, don't go to Twitter. I don't have one. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, like I said, I'm I'm terrible at uh, technology, uh, but I do have an Instagram. I do have a have an art station. So, I had to think about that one for a second. Can, what's that? I had to think about I did that have one for to a think second. About that one. I'm terrible at self promotion, so thank you for helping me uh, do that. As a, <laughs> the next step in my journey is getting my thing off the ground. Hey, well, we'll be here for that, and thank you so much for coming, and thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you.